Thank you, Steve. Hey, everybody. Hello, my fellow young people. It's good to see you all. I, uh, I have been a, a youth pastor since Joe Biden was a teenager. And so it's, it's uh, yeah, no, I, I've been relevant a really long time. So I'm so excited to, uh, to continue to minister to students, honestly, because I love ministering to students. I love preaching to, to high school students. I, I love to think about how much your faith at this point in your life uh, needs to take hold of you in a way like it never has before. So I know most of you grew up in the church, or many of you, and uh, you made a confession of faith early on in your life. Uh, you didn't want to go to hell. You, your parents were Christians. Uh, or your friend invited you to church, whatever it was. Uh, but it's at this stage and age that your faith really becomes your own. And I am eager to see the Spirit of God work among us this weekend as he uses his word to open your eyes afresh and to renew your commitment to him, to help you understand how important it is that you walk with Jesus during your teenage years and that he becomes uh, more precious to you than anything else in this world. Uh, youth ministry is my favorite. Uh, and now that my kids are, are your age, uh, I'm even more concerned about this generation uh, walking with Jesus and, and serving him well. And so when uh, Crawford asked me to come and uh, speak at this conference and suggested that I could do the book of Jonah, I was eager to be here. I've never been to Hutchinson before. I've been to Kansas many times, uh, but I had never been to Hutchinson. I got to play golf in 12 degree weather today. So... If I decide to get in the fetal position and just start making kind of a humming sound, that's me just trying to get my body heat back up. It's just a, a common Norwegian practice. Don't worry about it. Um, maybe call a doctor. But uh, it just it's, it's really good to be with you, and thank you all uh, for your warm and kind welcome. Let's dive right into a book that everybody, every church kid on planet Earth is familiar with. It's the most flannel graft Sunday school uh, veggie tale book on the planet, right? I mean, Jonah, really? You're going to talk about a fish. That's what you think. So let's, let's dive in, and I want to show you how much more there is for us in Jonah's amazing prophecy. So let's just jump in. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, it begins. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. And then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots. And the lot fell on Jonah. And then they said to him, tell us in whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew 
And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. And then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land. But they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord. O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. And then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights this is the very word of the living God father will you use your word even tonight in the hearts and minds of those gathered in this room, grant a defiant people submission to your word. Grant the disobedient a desire to be obedient from the heart. And most of all, show us the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us a glorious vision of Christ tonight through your word. We ask in his matchless name. Amen. The title of this sermon is A Defiant Prophet and a Sovereign God. That's what's happening in Jonah chapter 1. And maybe your exposure to the book of Jonah kind of ended on the Sunday school level. Maybe you colored in a big blue fish. Maybe you drew in a little stick man in his tummy. Maybe, like my kids, when they were little, they probably had half a dozen books on their shelves. And I think the, the big fish was on almost every single page. He's really not that big of a of a character in this book, but for some reason in the children's book, the fish kind of gets the lead role, probably has a really good literary agent or something, but this isn't a book about a fish. And though the defiant prophet has a lot to show us, it's not a book about Jonah either. This is a book that I think most people miss the point of because they're missing the main character being God. This is a a story, a real story that has so many potential distractions in it that you could possibly miss the main point and the most prominent feature and the most important character, which is God himself. You see, to study the book of Jonah, to look at it carefully and, and thoughtfully, is to understand that the message of Jonah is a message about God, a God whose compassion is beyond our comprehension. And understanding the book of Jonah is understanding what God is like, the same God who commissioned and called his servant Jonah, the same God who sent his servant and son, Jesus Christ. And the way God deals with the defiant and the rebels in the book of Jonah is instructive for all of us because of who we are 
and because of who he is. And so the relevance of Jonah is far more significant than anything happening in the newspaper today. The relevance of of Jonah is is more crucial than than the geopolitical scene and what countries are at war and, and who's dating who at school. And if you get into the college of your choice, the relevance of Jonah has to do with your eternal soul and the God who made you. And so as we study this book, we're up against some challenges. And, and the first challenge I think that we face in a book like, like Jonah, just to kind of get us all thinking Jonah-like, uh, is skepticism. If you study Jonah at all or heard a, maybe a teacher in school talk about it, unless you're homeschooled, I'm not talking to you because I'm sure your mom said nice stuff about the book of Jonah. Uh, Jonah is usually treated with a lot of skepticism. Even authors who've committed themselves to studying the Bible, many of them have chosen not to believe the message of Jonah. One author in his commentary said, surely this is not the record of actual historical events, nor was it ever intended to be so. As such, the story's poetry, not prose. It's a prose poem, not history. And he compares it to other Uh, Great works of literature. I remember that's how the book was talked about in college. Uh, Professors sneeringly would mock the account of, uh, of just how outrageous it is. How could there ever be a fish like this? Uh, Another scholar says in his book about Jonah that this is merely a piece of fiction written for propaganda. One scholar at Harvard said the story of Jonah is neither an account of actual happenings but an allegory of the destiny of Israel, the Messiah. The skepticism isn't just the sneering unbelievers who critically examine the Bible. Augustine, St. Augustine, one of my heroes, said the book of Jonah is a laughing stock for the pagan just because it's such an absurd story. Martin Luther, I mean, so crucial in the Reformation, so important in the history of the church, said Jonah is almost incredible sounding, more strange than any poet's fable. If it were not in the Bible, he said, I should take it for a lie. And so skepticism is, is kind of on the front page of Jonah. It's the first obstacle all of us face. And so I think I have to ask you, do you believe the book of Jonah? I mean, honestly, do you think this actually happened? Because if you do, You're in good company because the Lord Jesus Christ believed every word of the book of Jonah. And when Jesus himself confronted the skeptics of his day, he demanded that they take this book seriously. Because when the Jewish leaders demanded a sign from Jesus on two separate occasions, the only sign that Jesus would point them to, he said, was the prophecy of Jonah as their sign. You see, Jesus Christ took this book seriously very seriously and treated it with historical accuracy. In fact, Jesus is the one who mentions Jonah as the only prophet, not Ezekiel or Jeremiah or, or any of the rest that foreshadow his own ministry. Jesus thought of his own ministry as being something in common with Jonah. And the Jews didn't realize that. In John chapter 7, He points out that they were both from Galilee, showing up the critics of Jesus who said, no prophet has ever come from Galilee. And Jesus exposes their lack of Bible knowledge and their skepticism at the same time. And Jonah becomes a favorite place for Jesus to point to, for him to say, that's the sign that's coming, a sign that has something to do with three days and a resurrection. Those who did not believe in Jesus were warned. And I think any of us who are skeptical towards the Lord Jesus or towards his claims or towards the Bible are reminded by Jesus that someday this will be proven very, very true to you. More true than maybe anything else you've seen in this world because someday every skeptic will have a future encounter with some of the characters in this book. The Ninevites, according to Jesus, will be there on the day of judgment. And if you fail to believe what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, your skepticism won't stand for very long. 
because there's going to be a lot of Ninevites in heaven because of what unfolds in the book of Jonah. So it's not just skepticism that's an obstacle. I think another obstacle that we face in just tackling the book of Jonah, I've alluded to a little bit, is, is just superficiality. Superficiality. It's, uh, it's all those kids' books. It's all the veggie cartoons. It's uh, the book of Jonah being kind of a goofy story about how you should, you should be nice and you should obey and, and you know, whales can be sweet or, or whatever. And uh, the book of Jonah is about that on a really basic level. But that's really missing the point or focusing so much on the fish and and the swallowing of Jonah becomes the whole thing when really that's a, just a moment in this story. And people will look at the book of Jonah and they'll, they'll take away the story and they won't understand the point. And they'll miss the most significant character of all, which is God himself. They'll say, well, Jonah disobeyed and, and ran away. You shouldn't disobey and run away. Uh, God pursued him. Jonah prayed. Jonah obeyed. You should pray. You should obey. Uh, what do you do when you get to chapter four, one of the weirdest chapters in the whole Bible? I mean, do you even remember that part? Usually that's the part people just skip. None of the children's books that I have found, if you ever find a Jonah children's book that has chapter four in it, I will, I will, I want to receive it. Take a, <laughs> take a picture of it and email it to me. A. Duncan at gracechurch.org. Free of charge. <laughs> I will give you a 50 cent reward. They never put it in because they have no idea what to do with it. Jonah goes and spouts outside the city and sits under a plant that grows up supernaturally over him to give him shade and he feels better for a second. And then a worm that I picture being the size of a pug dog just goes hunk, 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 hunk and eats the plant and then Jonah's cussing at the worm and it is the weirdest, most bizarre scene maybe in the whole Bible. You can't put that in the children's book. They're like, don't run away like Jonah. Arr, eating worm, disaster, plant eating, kill worm. Just that's, that gives the kids bad dreams. <laughs> and so this like simplistic kind of superficial look at Jonah doesn't take into account the, the whole message, the whole thing. It's too strange. It's too hard. This cantankerous prophet who never seems to come around. Like, Jonah's never the hero here because he ends, you know, grumpy and pouting. And so it's like, how, what do you do with Jonah? I mean, if you, you read Old Testament stories and you think it's like, well, be like David. Well, except for like those six or eight times you shouldn't be like David. Or, you know, be, be, like, be like Moses. Well, except for those couple times you shouldn't be like Moses. If you just, if everything in the Old Testament is just like a be like, be like this, be like this, nobody's going to say be like Jonah. Run away, commit suicide in the ocean, almost kill a bunch of stranger sailors, uh, sink down to the bottom, live in a belly, write a psalm, get puked out, turn albino because of the acids on your skin, grumpily preach to the Ninevites, and then pout yourself to death. Be like Jonah. Have a good weekend, guys. I'm out. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a terrible message. It's superficial, and it's not the message of Jonah. I think it's also superficial to just get so distracted by the science of this book. I've heard preachers go on and on about, like, the size of a fish's gullet. I think this is a gullet. Como se llama gullet? And they're like, well, actually, you know, scientists found a, a Rolex and a shark's mouth, belly, gullet that was still ticking. And, a, you know, there's a story from 1912. And I've, I've said this before in a sermon and people have emailed me that story. Like, there really was a story from 1912. I'm like, I know. But the point isn't that, like, someone could actually fit in a, a fish's stomach, you know. Like, if you can get a custom Cadillac made, which... Why you're doing that, I don't understand at your age and stage. <laughs> then God can make a custom fish, right? I'm just not worried about the science of this working out. And so I think people get distracted by that part. Well, you know, water's cold and it slows your heart rate and you don't need as much oxygen in your brain. You need more oxygen in your brain because you're missing the point of Jonah. 
And so get rid of skepticism, get rid of superficiality, and actually listen to Scripture. Because it's God-breathed and it's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. One of my favorite famous Christian dead guys, Matthew Henry, says this. The story of Jonah is a simple story. Plain and pleasant. Easy enough to be enjoyed by children. Though it presents to us a very big God. You see, the star of the book of Jonah is not the recalcitrant, hard-hearted prophet. It's not the worm, and it's not the plant, and it is not the big fish with the big belly. The center point of the book of Jonah is a focus on God. And we have to take the whole story in to see it. We don't get to just pick and choose. Whenever I return to the Midwest, it is a return to my roots. I was born against my will in South Dakota. (laughs) So I golfed Prairie Dunes, one of the top 25 golf courses on the planet Earth, or at least in America, today. It's here in Hutchinson. Amazing. The Midwest has treasures. That's why I have the sniffles, because it was like 14 degrees, and I'd become a wimp in California. Anyway, whenever I return to this cold tundra, it reminds me of my birthplace. We used to drive where I I grew up in New Mexico. That is a state. Uh, It's neither new nor Mexico. But we used to drive my family from New Mexico to South Dakota every summer. And we would pass through lovely Kansas and Oklahoma and Nebraska and Iowa and finally get to South Dakota. And sometimes we'd go to the other side of South Dakota and go go to the Black Hills where I was born. And there's a really famous monument there. You've seen it. Mount Rushmore. How many of you have been to Mount Rushmore? A bunch of you guys. It's because we're in the Midwest. It's just a stone's throw, which is like three days drive. So... I remember going as a little kid and being like, wow. And then I remember going back later when I was in high school. And high schoolers are famous because they never say wow to anything. They just go like, okay. You guys are not cool. So I remember being in that stage and age. It's a wonderful stage. And going to Mount Rushmore and thinking, smaller than I thought. Like it looks kind of miniature when you're going up with the the walkway and the flags. It's just like when I was a kid, I remember this being like grandiose and now I'm, you know, I'm high schooler. So I'm kind of emo about everything and no offense, no offense. By the way, this weekend, when I say no offense, you say none taken. Let's practice. No offense. Perfect. We're going to get along great. So So I'll say offensive stuff, and you'll say no offense, and you'll say, love it. Good, we're going to get along. Okay, so so I remember going to see Mount Rushmore and being like, meh. And then my uncle, I have a crazy uncle. You have a crazy uncle? Yeah, no offense. That was, your uncle was supposed to say none taken. So he paid for us to go in one of those bubble glass helicopters, me and my cousin. And we went up in this one of those bubble, like a tourist helicopter, a tiny little frame with all the glass on all the sides. And he paid it for us to go up in this helicopter. And I remember it distinctly because I thought, I'm going to die at 16. <laughs> because the pilot was, how do you say? Ancient, <laughs> elderly, frail, Joe Biden old. <laughs> and he was just like, Hey, kids, welcome in. Yeah, I got a heart condition. And so it's just scary, but finally we get up there and we get right up to George Washington's nose. And George Washington's nose is 21 feet long. On Mount Rushmore, not actual George Washington. Some of you stop paying attention for a second. George Washington had a regular sized nose. Longer than other presidents, though, because the other presidents' nose are 20 feet long on Mount Rushmore, so Washington did have a schnoz. But we go up to it in the helicopter, and it's like 
so huge when you're that close. Welcome, guys. We're just talking about George Washington's nose. You haven't missed anything yet. (laughs) Open your Bible to the book of Jonah and Mount Rushmore. (laughs) Anyway, we're up to the, the thing, and it's just massive. Seeing it up close in the detail of this rock that's been transformed from a granite mountain into this extraordinary sculpture. Seeing it first from afar and and being fooled that there wasn't much to it. And then being able to go close to it and examine the whole thing. And and then to get a little taste of the, the history and just how many people lost their lives constructing this thing. The details and the entire of it, all of it together, 60 feet, five or six stories high, a different perspective informed me and impressed me. And when we get close to the text of Jonah, when we look at this book in its details and we look at it as a whole and we bring those perspectives together, we see that this is not some silly little story for kids. It's not a meager or moralistic tale. It's a highly sophisticated one. It has a a rich theological agenda, a real narrative about real historical events that have a purpose of teaching us something about God, the most important being in the universe. This author is genius. He has a deep appreciation for satire. It's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be ironic. And he has a transcendent message for his audience. And Jonah draws from language from the Bible that's gone before him, bringing together so much of the scriptures, the Psalms and the book of Genesis with intense imagery and powerful and poetic language. This is a book that is fixed and focused and riveted on the character of God, a book that was one of of Jesus's favorites to refer to and that one that he compared himself to like he compared himself to no other prophet and I think the apostle Paul had the book of Jonah in its reading in mind when he wrote his magnificent masterpiece that is Romans chapter 11 when he talked about mercy being shown to the disobedient and mercy being shown to all when he wrote Ephesians 2 and he talked about those who are far off off, coming near. It would be impossible for an Old Testament scholar like Paul not to think of those Ninevites who became followers of the God of Israel. This story is an odyssey, a fascinating journey at sea that takes its readers to the very depths of the ocean and to the edge of the desert, to the most formidable chief city of the infamously brutal Assyrian Empire, and it brings us to a final conclusion that shows us that we better never get wrong this one thing. What is God like? Because what we walk away with in the book of Jonah is an unmistakable portrait of God's grace. A God whose mercy is given and it can't be contained in the boundaries of Israel. It is the story of a confrontation between an antagonistic Jonah, God's own prophet, and a protagonist, God, his incredible compassion and defiance and salvation that cannot be thwarted. God will keep his word and uphold all his promises, and God will use his servant no matter how defiant. The book of Jonah records for us the most successful missionary campaign in redemptive history. It's not about a whale, and it's not about a wayward prophet. It is about God. So let's get close. Hop in my bubble helicopter, and I will keep you safe. Probably. What a God we have in the book of Jonah. 25 times the name Yahweh When you see it in capital letters in the book of Jonah, I'll start saying Yahweh there where it says Lord because that's what God's name was. It's the name he gave to his people and it's important to make that distinction because, well, this scripture makes that distinction. You see, the 
sailors that we encounter in this chapter were worshipers of gods with an S on the end and a little g. All kinds of different gods. They were pagans. They were Syrophoenicians. They were sailors. They, that means they cussed a lot, drank a lot, and worshipped anything. Still true of sailors today. And when we encounter God's name in this book, it's telling us something specific about the God of Israel. He's repeatedly featured and focused on. And if you miss something in this book, please do not miss its portrait of God. 25 times. A total of 39 times the reference is made to God. A book that's only 40 verses long. It's a book that divides kind of into two parts. It has markers that say, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah at the beginning of of chapter one, and and it divides really evenly because in chapter three, it says, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah. So it's kind of a a two-part saga. If it was a a mini-series on Netflix, it would come at you in two pieces, and you'd be left hanging after the first one, wondering what's going to happen. And it's a book that I could read it out loud, the whole thing to you in like less than eight minutes. And so it's really a book that we can capture in just just a day together. And so let's apply ourselves to this text. And tonight I want to talk about a prophet's defiance and a sovereign God's pursuit. And we might not make it through both parts, but we got all weekend. Come on, let's go. So let's begin a prophet's defiance, point one, a prophet's Defiance, a prophet's defiance. Verse one to three. Now the word of Yahweh came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of Yahweh. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of Yahweh. What's featured in this passage, what's so clear and what's so shocking and what's so remarkable in this passage and so relevant to the life of a teenager is that we identify something that we're all familiar with here. And it's that idea of defiance. You understand defiance. Sometimes toddlers can be defiant. They insist on their own way. Sometimes teenagers can be defiant. They refuse to listen to the person that's trying to tell them something. Sometimes husbands and wives can be defiant. You see, defiance is something that has destroyed families, that has disrupted entire countries. Defiance is something so timely, so familiar to us, and it's exactly what's on display in these opening verses. It's emphasized in a way that that would be glowing at us from these opening verses. A prophet who's defiant is featured in these opening words. You have to hear the clarity of, of what God is asking Jonah. I mean, there's no intro to this book. There's no, you know, kind of introduction telling us tons and tons of stuff about Jonah and who the king was and other Old Testament prophets sounded a lot more like this. This one just begins so starkly. Now the word of Yahweh came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Jonah's defiance, it literally opens because the word of God is the first thing we see. The word of God came. That's a phrase... Defiant baby. I'm just kidding. That's a cute baby. That's a phrase, the word of the Lord came, that you find in the Old Testament probably a hundred times. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, it came to Amos, it came to Ezekiel, and it came to Jonah. And this isn't the first time Jonah's ever been in the Bible either, just so you know. If you check Jonah's LinkedIn profile, you'd find out he has the credentials of a prophet. 
Google him up, Jonah, prophet. And he's mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 14, a chapter that describes a cruel, diabolical, and godless reign of a king named Jeroboam the second. This little tiny paragraph tucked away in 2 Kings, maybe you listen to it on your audio Bible in the drive here, but just in case you didn't, I'll tell you what it says. It says that the people of Israel and their king were, were doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And God tells Jonah to, to speak to these people. And it shows that God responded to the disobedience of his people, the, the rebellion, the idolatry of his people, by restoring the border of Israel from the entrance of Amas as far as the Sea of Arab, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel. And who was it that brought the message? Well, the message was a message that was for disobedient Israel, and the message was God is going to bless you anyway. What an easy job. And you know who he had bring the message? A prophet named Jonah, son of Amittai. This same guy, I mean, he's worked for God before. He's represented God before. He's spoken on behalf of God before. The word of the Lord has come to Jonah before, and it was a message of blessing, a message of kindness in the face of disobedience and apostasy. And this man, Jonah, spoke on behalf of God, the prophet who is of gath uh, Jonah administered on behalf of the Lord before he came. Uh, he would have been in the line of the prophets of Elijah, the school of the prophets. His ministry would have existed in the northern kingdom in the time of the ten tribes tribes, a time when Israel was defiant towards God and disobedient to God. And, and Jonah's job back then was to bring a, a message of blessing. It's kind of a remarkable thing, right? I mean, it's a really easy job. I mean, Ezekiel had to watch his wife die and not cry any tears. Other prophets had very difficult jobs and they were told and commissioned, go and, and preach against the people and none of them will listen to you, but you preach anyway. Jeremiah gets chucked in a hole in the ground. Jonah is like, okay, disobedient Israel, everybody gets presents. What a good job. What an easy job. Amos, one of his contemporaries, had to go to the king's front door and condemn him. Not Jonah, he says, we're all getting more land. We're blessed of God. But Jonah was a prophet. He knew God and he knew what was really going on. And many of the people of God confused God's compassion for his commendation. And when Jonah brought this positive message, he must have been a very popular preacher because lots of the people would confuse God's mercy for God's favor. And I wonder what Jonah thought when he heard from God that day, when he opened his email and got an email from God or however the vision came, it doesn't say, probably was an email. We don't know if it was a dream, a vision, an audible voice or what, but the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and he'd already heard from God before. He'd already represented God before. What did he anticipate? What did he expect? God, you've got to call these people to get back in line. That must have been what Jonah was thinking just based on kind of his personality in this book. You can't just keep blessing these people. They have to change. They have to honor you. They have to put away their idols. What do you want me to say, God? You bless your covenant people even though they don't deserve it. They need to be faithful to you. Maybe let's ramp the message up. I don't know what he's thinking, something like that. But so far, all he's given them is prosperity at a time of iniquity. I mean, it's a really dangerous message and one that, that we can fall into all the time because we can get confused because perhaps you are living a life of sin, some of you in this room right now. You're, you got hypocrisy, you got a totally different life at school, you got secret stuff going on you haven't told anybody about, and last time you checked, you don't have cancer. No lightning hit you. And so maybe you're like the Israelites, very disobedient, very unfaithful, full of false worship, but apparently being blessed by God. Don't confuse God's mercy with God's favor. And so Jonah's thinking, God, you gotta let these people have it. Can't possibly be more blessing. He knows that God is a righteous judge. But listen to what he hears. Three verbs, arise, go, and cry out. 
Three prophetic terms that are not unusual that God would give to his prophet. Arise, go, and cry out. But what makes this message absolutely unequaled in all of scripture, what makes this message so unusual and unbelievable is Jonah is told to arise, go, and cry out to Nineveh, the great city. God's prophet to his covenant people, Israel, who God has been working with and working through and working among since their very beginning and from their very existence is now not the object of this message. Prophets had talked about other nations before, like in a side way, like mentioned there's some, there's some trouble coming for Babylon or, or whatever. There's, there's lots of prophets that talk about the nations while they're talking to Israel. No prophet has ever told, go, rise, get up, bring the word of God to Nineveh? It's so shocking, it's so provocative, and and it's ultimately so unacceptable to Jonah that no other prophet had been sent in this way. Sure, messages and warnings and judgments, but they were primarily for God's covenant people. No prophet had ever been sent with the word of Yahweh to a pagan nation, especially a pagan nation like Nineveh. Nineveh was the chief or capital city of Assyria. Assyria was the worst enemy of God's people at the time. Never had a prophet been sent there. Never had a prophet been sent to a foreign land with his word. Certainly not to Assyria, not to Nineveh. And God gives Jonah the reason that their evil has come up before me. And Jonah, who's a prophet of God, a student of God's word, who understood the law of God and the character of God to a certain extent, recognized that phrase that God gave him from the book of Genesis. Their evil has come up before me. Do you know where it's from? Anybody? Bible scholar? Have you heard that somewhere in Genesis? Their evil has come up before me. You're allowed to talk during this part. Yes, my guy! Become a preacher. (laughs) He said Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's absolutely right. Yeah, you got it. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? That uber sinful town, not uber drive, but uber lots. Super sinful town that Lot and his family were supposed to flee from and and they said to God, well, are there any righteous people there? Let's try to save the town. And God says, nope, no righteous people there. Smoke it. Sodom and Gomorrah got no warning. No leaflets before the bombing. No prophet that went in and said, hey guys, you might want to change your ways. God took Lot and his family, pulled him out, and whoosh, roasted the whole thing. And so Jonah's concerned because though this is the language of Sodom and Gomorrah, the distinct difference is a prophet is being sent to warn the Ninevites I mean, if the message was, hey, Jonah, put on sunglasses because I'm going to torch this joint, I think Jonah would have said, shades on, let's go. This is a highly unusual message, and if you ask Jonah, it's completely unacceptable. And so what does Jonah do? Well, he defies He sent to Nineveh, the chief city of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, This city would become the capital of Assyria eventually, a nation famous for its brutality, for beheading, for inventing torturous ways to maim and kill their enemies. And instead of being told to burn it, burn it, blow it up, consume it, send it to brimstone, the assumption behind this message is this nation, this nation is somehow accountable to Yahweh, the God of Israel, and is going to have Yahweh's precious word, which is a resource that is exclusive to Israel in Jonah's mind, brought to them? And Jonah didn't like it. He sees in it a hope of repentance. He wonders, since God was blessing us and now he's not even talking to us, is he going to now move his blessing from Israel to Nineveh? Not on my watch. And so in verse three, we see Jonah's response to God's clear command. It's only one that can be described as defiant. 
Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So we went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, paid the fare, went down to it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. There's seven lines of Hebrew in verse three and it starts with the word Tarshish and it ends with the word Tarshish and it has Tarshish in the middle. It's going Tarshish, Tarshish, Tarshish. I like this pulpit, it's cool. It's got Hell's Kitchen vibes and it's got a metal ring sound. Donkey. No offense. Thank you. I actually really needed that one. Tarshish, Tarshish, Tarshish. Why is he putting emphasis like that? Well, because it's such a clear violation of God's commands. Nineveh is northeast. It's over there. It's far. It's like the Iberian Peninsula. It's like Morocco area. I'm sorry, Tarshish is, Tarshish is. Easy, Duncan. Tarshish is over there. Nineveh is northeast, the eastern bank of the Tigris, a modern city of Mosul in in Iraq. Nineveh, this ancient city, its founding mentioned in Genesis 10, a city of prominence. The Assyrian Empire is 500 miles away to the northwest is Nineveh. It's a three-month journey, and Jonah goes the exact opposite way to Tarshish, Tarshish, Tarshish. It's a way of underlining Jonah's defiance. Jonah's disposition towards God is, I quit. Get somebody else. He was called by God, the creator God, the God that he stood in the presence of to represent, to call, to go to Nineveh. So instead of going north, he goes south to Joppa to the coast and finds a vessel to take him to Tarshish. Uh, The seaport was full of ships. They were called Tarshish ships. They were ships that meant to go a long distance across the entirety of the Mediterranean. The location of Tarshish, though somewhat unknown, is probably likely around the area of Gibraltar and Spain. And there's a similar name in Asia Minor, but it doesn't really matter. All that you need to know is that Tarshish is not Nineveh. It's the opposite way. It's the wrong way. Tarshish is the ancient equivalent of saying, I'm going to Timbuktu. I'm out of here. Somewhere completely alien. Someplace far away. The furthest possible way. Thousands of miles away. He finds a ship. And in God's providence, there's space on that ship. He has enough money to pay the fare in God's providence. It'd be a considerable sum of money to buy a ticket to go that far. But he's got enough money. God provides. And I wonder if Jonah starts to discern the will of God in a positive way. Like, hey, this is working out really well for me. He received clear direction from God, but in this act of audacious defiance, total disobedience and rebellion, he disobeys God. And there's no hesitancy in Jonah's disobedience. There's no confusion in Jonah. There's not weakness. There's not ignorance. Other prophets have said things like, I'm too young, Jeremiah. I'm not clean enough, Isaiah. Moses talked about his own inadequacy as a speaker. Jonah says, no. He doesn't balk. He declines. He defies God. He blatantly turns him down and goes the other way. And in verses four and following, what we want to convince you of is that no matter how defiant God's prophet is, God's purposes of deliverance, God's sovereignty is never thwarted by our defiance. And so Jonah answers in verse 4. He's answered in verse 4, but Jonah in verse 3 is followed by, but the Lord in verse 4. And how does God respond while Jonah defies God and Yahweh hurls a great wind on the sea and there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up? The word hurl, to cast, to throw, it's the same word that's used in the story of Saul throwing his spear at David. He wasn't donating his spear to David. Here's a spear. He was trying to pin David to the wall to kill David. It's that kind of a throw. Unlike Saul, God never misses. And so Jonah defies God. And Yahweh, in this passage, starts throwing stuff. And the wind comes. And a group of men who are seafarers or mariners or sailors, by their life's work, have never seen a storm like this one before. And it's just another reminder that your sin is so impossible to contain. Like it'll mess you up and it'll lead to God's judgment in your life, but will always affect other people. 
And so now Jonah's sin is affecting these random pagan sailors, putting their very lives in danger in this massive storm that scares even sailors. Jonah's defiance is now causing problems for others because sin is like that. It doesn't stay in its boundaries well. So God commands the forces of nature. What a dumb phrase that is, forces of nature. Because they're his forces. The Hebrew idiom in verse four is the ship was thinking to break up. The ship was thinking, okay, I'm, I'm gonna bust now. That's how bad the storm was. Everyone is in trouble. Their lives are in danger. And in verse five, we find Jonah, after the sailors have tried all nautical solutions, undoubtedly, now they've given up on the whole point of a trip. The point of being a sailor, besides the cussing and the worshiping idols, is to make money, like you haul stuff. And so once you throw the stuff into the ocean, you're sunk. I mean, you're in real trouble. You've lost all the financial benefit of this whole thing. But they're so aware that they're about to die that they chuck the stuff. And the captain, interesting in the Greek translation of this, the Septuagint, uh, the captain uh, follows the sound of Jonah snoring. Strange addition, but probably exactly what was happening. He goes down into the hold and, and Jonah is sleeping super well. Sort of like that guy in the third row from the back. Just kidding, just kidding. He's sleeping okay. But Jonah is out. I mean, he's completely out. Snoring, sawing logs, Z-Quill, REM, whatever. He's done. And I wonder if this is Jonah like, man, that went really well. Never turned down God before, but not too bad, not too shabby. I'm going to have a nap. Wow. Sometimes sinners sleep just fine. And that's not okay. The captain goes down and wakes up Jonah. I mean, just another moment there about sinners sleeping just fine. That is not unusual at all, actually. The hymn, not a surge of worry, not a shade of care. I've met a lot of people in rebellion against God who think that's where they're at too. They're in rebellion against God, they're in defiance of God and they just don't give a rip. Because they look around at their circumstances and they think, I'm doing fine. Because they mistake the patience and forbearance and mercy of God as God's approval. Somebody leaves their wife and says, I've I've never been you know, more close to God. I'm just so sure that he's leading me through my sinful decisions. Wrong. Wrong is Jonah in the boat, almost killing all these sailors. In verse six, the nightmare begins and Jonah's deep sleep is over. The captain comes down and says, how is it that you are sleeping? Man, how many times has my wife said that to me? Once dads get to a certain stage, they really master the Jonah sleep. Not the defiance of God part, but just the good quality should I. Because we raised you. Yeah. You've seen your dad sleep. It's, it's, it's really a remarkable thing, isn't it? Welcome, kids. We're talking about George Washington. Come on in. We're talking about sleeping. Uh, this is not a place for sleeping, though. Welcome in. Everybody, let's clap for these friends that just made it. But there's the front row is yours. Come on, let's do it. Do it. It's like a whole line. It's the exact number of chairs you guys need. Almost. Maybe the dudes need to sit on the floor like gentlemen. This is not a lot of dudes in this group. This is a lady group. Are you the dude of the group? No, there's some in the van. Oh, okay. Dudes in the van. How Jonah like, right? Just sleeping in the van. Girls, there's some chairs there. There's some chairs here. Just welcome in. Glad to have you. Where'd you guys come from? Kansas City, that's where I came from. This very day, I drove here from Kansas City. Okay, let's let's go back. Jonah 1, hop in. Okay, so what's happening? Jonah is sleeping in his boat. 
And the captain comes down and jolts him awake. And what a nightmare that in God's sovereignty, the captain uses the very same verbs that God used in his call to Jonah. Arise! Same words that God said to Jonah. That had to scare him, right? Call out to your God. Perhaps he'll be concerned about us so that we will not perish. How jolting had that have to be for Jonah? The same words he heard from God that he defied. Arise, call out. And now the sailors are all praying to their different gods. It's like a Unitarian church service in this boat. The pagans are praying. They exhort Jonah to pray. But Jonah doesn't pray, not yet. And Yahweh has not stopped pursuing Jonah. And now his sovereignty is in full display. The prophet's defiance. God God's sovereignty. We're seeing God's sovereignty because now he not only controls the wind and the waves and he's holding this boat together somehow and his prophet is defying him, but God's plan is unchanged. Now he's going to control the dice. They had an ancient method of divination that cast some stones like color one uh, on one side, uh, one side light, one side dark. That means roll again. Two sides dark means no. Two sides light means yes. And so they had some way of trying to determine the will of the gods by this rolling of dice. I, I don't recommend it. I'm not authorizing it. But I'm telling you that's how they used to do it. And, and God even controlled that in this circumstance. He will not let his cantankerous prophet go. He still resists. Jonah is exposed. And in great irony, in verse 9, he has fled to not witness these pagans in Nineveh. He doesn't want to talk to them and tell them that God has a message for them. And now he's ironically stuck on a boat of pagan sailors, and he has to do exactly that. And they put him on trial. Who are you? Where are you from? What's your job? What's going on here? And he says, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God of heaven. What a rich statement. Jonah is a Hebrew. A people chosen and made by God. And he says, I fear Yahweh. Really, Jonah, do you? There are a lot of people who claim to be following God when they're actually doing the exact opposite. Maybe some of you tonight. He says, my God made the sea and the dry land. Their God's made, you know, each God was kind of responsible for some specialized thing. But he says, my God made all of it. And this makes the sailors exceedingly afraid. In 10, in verse 5, they're afraid. In verse 10, they're exceedingly afraid. And because he told them he was fleeing from the presence of his omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent God, uh, they look at verse 11, they ask him what to do. And Jonah, rather than saying, I, I, I admit it, I, I messed up, turn the boat around, I have to obey. He says, I would rather be thrown into a raging sea, which is Jonah's way of saying, I would rather die than obey God. But they don't want to kill him. The pagans have morals. They understand that the implications of being thrown off the boat into the middle of a raging ocean are certain death. And so they try harder to row, to land without effect. And finally, these pagan sailors become less pagan as each verse goes by. Next thing you know, they're calling out to Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel that they learned about two seconds ago by name earnestly praying to the one true God and they say to God do not put this man's life in innocent blood on us you have done this they see God's hand in it they see God's sovereignty in it they learned about God two minutes ago and they already have better practical theology than Jonah does they're living better than Jonah is they see his power in creation and they say we have to chuck him overboard just like he said and they do it and in the height of Jonah's defiance In the height of Jonah's disobedience and sinfulness, he says, I would rather die than obey. It is not noble self-sacrifice happening here with Jonah. It is saying, throw me off because I'd rather accept the consequences of death because my defiance is so real. I will not obey God. I would rather die. This is white-knuckled, hot-headed defiance. And you don't just find it in a Bible story. You can find it in your own heart. The book of Romans says all of us are sinners by nature and by choice. All of us 
fight, resist, and suppress the knowledge of God. The timely relevance of this book for a teenager in this room tonight is that all of you have experienced the defiant nature of sin in your own heart. And it's one thing to look at it on Jonah and say, what a dum-dum. He thinks he can get away from God? (laughs) As you stare your parents in the face and say, I will not do what you're asking. As you listen to God's clear word in youth group every week that says, don't let there be even a hint of sexual immorality among you, yet you keep clicking. You keep pressuring her. You keep chasing immorality. Defiance isn't just Jonah's thing. You can find it alive and well in the heart of every sinner. Jonah would rather die than obey. Verse 14 through 16 show the sailors' improvement in their fear. They pick up Jonah, they throw him into the sea, and the sea suddenly stops. No longer raging. In verse 16, the men feared Yahweh greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows. Wow. These sailors, they're awesome. They have have a church on the boat now. These guys, I mean, they're, they're the deacons and the elders and the congregation. And I mean, this is like an awesome little church in this boat. Jonah didn't want to be a missionary. Guess what? You're a missionary, Jonah. You just planted your first church. First church of sailors. Mariner's Chapel. That's better. I like that. Somebody write that down. They're ignorant in their fear in verse 5 because of this big storm. They're informed of their fear in verse 10 once they find out who Jonah is running from. And after they've seen the storm stop, they cast the lots and they listen to the prophet's word. Verse 16 describes their fear in a submissive way from ignorance to information to submission. I mean, the quality of the fear of these sailors. They become God-fearers right before our eyes in just a matter of moments. They're persuaded by the power of God's judgment. Jonah was unwilling to preached to pagans and now he's put on a church service and the captain has become the captain of a congregation and the sailors have become saints and you think man Duncan you're reading a lot into this little moment just because they're offering God the covenant God of Israel vows sorry I have a hard time presenting your case fairly because I believe what I'm saying does it seem like I'm doing too much there does it seem like they're they're, they're, too too quick of a conversion I mean, if you don't agree with me, I mean, I could simply solve this when we're in heaven together someday. I'll introduce you to these guys. I mean, I think they're saved. Verse 14, they say to God, to Yahweh, the covenant name of God, you have done as you pleased. In verse 14, they confess and acknowledge his sovereignty. In verse 16, they fear Yahweh with a great fear. They sacrifice, they vow vows, they sought him in prayer, they confessed his freedom, they tremble over his presence, they worship by sacrifice. Well, are they really saved though? Like, aren't they going to fall into their old sailor ways? Ralph Davis, my favorite Old Testament author, says, if there's such a thing as perseverance of the saints, as some of us think, maybe there's such a thing as perseverance of the sailors. These mariners are the seemingly coincidental recipients of a wayward prophet's evangelistic defiance that bears much fruit along the way. And I just love to pause and marvel at that. Marvel at the mercy of God. What a God we have. What a Savior we have. Nothing is too hard for God. God that can hurl the wind can also cast faith to the faithless. I hope none of you defiant sinners in this room tonight think for a moment that God's mercy cannot reach you and cannot change you and cannot rescue you. That's something you've got to gain from this portrait of God in the book of Jonah. 
Nothing is too hard from God. God can reach and God can save. And as Jonah describes his plight in his prayer in chapter two, we'll get tomorrow morning. We remember that God's voice that spoke to Jonah is speaking even tonight through his word to us. And though Jonah defied it, the clear command defied by Jonah, God's sovereignty is on beautiful display as he orchestrates pandemonium and extends deliverance to these sailors. Jonah hasn't prayed yet and Jonah hasn't been rescued yet, but that'll come tomorrow morning. Right now, Jonah thinks he got away from God by telling the sailors to kill him. And Jonah's expectations and Jonah's defiance will come together in Jonah's rescue and deliverance. But tonight I want you to pause and ask yourself, have you acknowledged your defiance against God? Have you recognized it? Have you recognized how many ways you have disobeyed God's clear command, ignored the word of God, and sometimes even do the very opposite of what God has called you to do? You see, the same God who was defied is the same God who rescues these sailors and who preserves the life of his servant, a life that Jonah doesn't deserve to have, a life that's not going to show a lot of evidence of quick change here. But his prophet's defiance highlights the magnanimity and the mercy and the grace and glory of God. Jonah tries to run away. And some of you have been running from God for a long, long time. Some of you have had stark, defiant, white-knuckled defiance against God for a long time. Some of you are Jonah-like And you think you can get away from the God of Psalm 139 who is everywhere and who will hound you until the day that you die. Jonah wanted no part of God's mercy, his rescue plan, and so he was insubordinate, openly defiant, and rebellious. And he tells God, I will not go. He tells the sovereign God of the universe, his creator, I will not go. Is that amazing to you? Does that shock you that Jonah would tell God no? Can you believe it? Is it appalling to you? Are you sitting there thinking what a fool Jonah was? In Jewish synagogues, they read the Old Testament on a calendar. They always have. Do you know that on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the highest and holiest day on the Jewish calendar, they always read the same passage of Scripture? On the Day of Atonement, it's been like this for thousands of years, thousands of years. The calendar reading on that day is the book of Jonah. And as the, the reader stands in front of the congregation in the synagogue, he reads the book of Jonah. And the tradition is that all the people stand up and in one voice as a congregation say these words, we are Jonah. We are Jonah. It's easy to sit and judge Jonah's lack of compliance, Jonah's defiance, but friends, we are all Jonah. You are Jonah. I am Jonah. Every time we disobey God, because are we not also the privileged recipients of the word of God? Have we not heard clearly from God? Do you not know what God's requirements are for you? I mean, I could give you some examples. Paul wrote a letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians 6.1. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for that is right. Is that clear? The Bible says, forgive as you've been forgiven. How about that one? There's not to be a hint of sexual morality among you. How about that one? Let your speech always be seasoned with grace. How about that one? 
Every one of God's clear requirements about your life, your speech, your future, about forgiveness more than anything else, about the gospel is crystal clear. If you remain in defiance to God, if you refuse to repent, to confess your sins, to turn from them, to see them at God, sees them and admit your sin and believe on Christ. If you remain in defiance, your defiance will damn you. It will damn you. And so we're all Jonas because to hesitate and to turn uh, to our sin and away from God is to defy God's clear commands about how we are to live for him and him alone, how we are to pray to him and him alone, how we are to worship him and him alone, how we are to trust in Jesus and Jesus alone, how our sin's only possible solution is found at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to hold Hold on to this gospel with all our hope and we are to share this gospel with dying people all around us to fulfill the commission that Jesus gave to us but so often we are Jonah. We're all in Jonah's boat. There's none righteous, not even one, Romans 3.10. Not one who understands, not one who seeks for God. They've turned aside, all of them become useless. There's none, not even one who does good. We keep deceiving. The poison of snakes is under the lips and our mouths full of cursing and bitterness. Our feet are quick to shed innocent blood, misery in the paths of peace. There's no fear of God before our eyes. That's it. That's all of us, friends. We're all in defiance to God, defiant rebels. Then he is the sovereign God who knows exactly where we are and we can never hide from him and he can always reach us to deliver and to save and if you're unsaved tonight if you've not been forgiven if you've not truly confessed your sin and turned to Jesus oh you are Jonah Jonah in a big way and your defiance will condemn you forever because the gospel is the message that Jesus Christ came to save sinners like you and the gospel is a command and the gospel is a promise God commands all men everywhere to repent and promises that if you trust in Jesus, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved because we're all Jonas, all sinful. Well, almost all of us. There's one, one who is not Jonah and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the righteous one. He was never defiant, never disobedient. And because of that perfect obedience, he is the savior. Philippians 2 tells us that even to the point of death and beyond on the cross, he was obedient because Jesus was unlike Jonah in this way. He was perfectly obedient to God. He said, I came to do your will, O God. He was never defiant. He said things like, it's my food to do the will of my Father who sent me. And so the entirety of the life of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, was all obedience. All obedience to the plan of God and all available to us Jonah-like sinners to become our obedience and our righteousness. Because when we turn to him in faith and repentance to trust God and trust in Christ's life and death and resurrection and recognize how Jonah like we are and find deliverance. And that's what we'll look at tomorrow as Jonah sinks low and God reaches down to save. Father, thank you for your word. Your sinful prophet reminds us of ourselves. And you, oh God, you haven't changed at all. You are still sovereign, still merciful, still a God of compassion beyond our comprehension. May we not confuse your patience and your grace and your mercy with your approval because the only way we find your approval is by hanging close to the cross and seeking 
Jesus by faith for mercy. Thank you that you answer the sinner's cry. Do that even tonight, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.